There's a lot of games I played the demo for at some point, only to never see it or hear from it ever again. IDOS was a company that I would run into semi-frequently through game demos. I've never played any of the classic Tomb Raider games, and I've never played a Soul Reaver game, but when I was younger, I did play demos for them. But those are games that people actually know about. Tomb Raider more so than Soul Reaver, but even still, it's not hard to find info on those games online. But there was one game that I played in the demo section of Gex 3 that I never heard from again. In fact, Gex 3 even had a whole bonus level entirely based on it too. That game was Akuji the Heartless, a platformer adventure game developed by Crystal Dynamics, who you might know for Gex and Soul Reaver, and then published by IDOS, who you probably know for, you know, obviously Tomb Raider. Um, those were two names that I saw in the same box pretty frequently back then, and it's because while they were both originally separate entities, Crystal Dynamics was purchased by IDOS in 1998, permanently putting them under IDOS's umbrella. I remember reading about this for the first time in an issue of GamePro, Volume 123 to be precise. Size. Laura, meet Gex. Two of gaming's best known personalities will be sharing the spotlight soon. Hold on, you're telling me that Gex was one of the most iconic gaming personalities. Seasons sure do change, I guess. Jesus, cost them 47 million to buy Crystal Dynamics. I guess they were pretty much in their prime back then, like the Gex series was a commercial success after all, and with the highly anticipated Soul Reaver on the way, IDOS wanted in on it. And one of the very first games they put out after this acquisition was none other than... Akuji the Heartless. I feel like this game marks a transitionary period for Crystal Dynamics, not just the means of business and who owns the company, but also a transition in tone. Before they made Akuji, Crystal Dynamics mostly made light-hearted and goofy games, you know, like Gex and Pandemonium. They would even use Gex as their mascot for years, like this was a company with the G-rated poster boy. But then after Akuji, they would start focusing on games for more mature audiences, putting out tons of Legacy of Kane games, and then their eventual work on the Tomb Raider series. Series. As you guys have probably guessed, Akuji quickly faded into obscurity. So much, in fact, that the people who do remember this game couldn't even remember what it was called. A frequent Google search I ended up finding was, that PS1 game where your heart was ripped out? Uh, yeah, that was Akuji. I'm really not expecting a whole lot from this game. It was probably something they put out just to test the waters and get a feel for making more mature games before tackling something like Soul Reaver. But yeah, either way, why don't we see what they slap together for this one. Um, I'm not doing a close-up this time. Let's just do this. Oh, it, it opens up to a demo selection screen. That's so weird. Usually the demos are tucked away in a nice menu accessible from the title screen, but here, the title screen is the demo screen. You can really tell that the priority here was marketing all of these other games. It feels like a demo disc that just happens to have a full game on it as well. All right then, uh, why don't we check out this uh, this Akuji the Heartless game that came on this demo disc. Yeah, hmm, let's, let's just see if this is any good. Akuji. Oh, okay, here's the real title screen, uh, yeah, you can tell they didn't put a whole lot of effort into it, for comparison's sake, here's the title screen of the other game they were working on at the time, yeah, you can really tell where all the budget went. The story starts with a pre-rendered cutscene, I'm just waiting for the supercut of the how many times I've said that exact sentence in these videos. Uh, yeah, it shows a bunch of b-roll of some ritual or whatever, as Akuji explains that he's a warrior and a voodoo priest who was getting married to unite his tribe with another tribe. But then his wedding was interrupted when Akuji was murdered and had his heart removed in a voodoo ritual. This sent him to the underworld instead of passing on properly. Akuji then strikes a deal with Baron Samity. If he's to find and sacrifice the souls of his and ancestors, he will be then granted back into the world of the living. He can then reunite with Kesho, his bride. Ew, this intro is is graphic, like the maggots and the gore and the wax being bored. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked this only received a T rating, like especially since they were much less lenient about stuff like this back then. But anyway, we're plopped into the rivers of the underworld. The controls feel a bit heavy, like they were going for that realistic feeling of moving the weight of a human being. I really hate it when games back then tried to do stuff like this. I feel like that was something that you couldn't 
didn't really do well until like the Xbox 360 and the PS3. You know, I think Uncharted 1 was probably the first game to do it really well. Here in PS1 town though, it just feels kind of sluggish. It feels less like you're telling him where to go and more like you're suggesting where you want him to go, if that makes any sense. Like most games that do this, I didn't have a problem with it once I got used to it, but I still wish they opted out for more traditional arcade-like controls instead. Now at face value, this definitely seems like a game more serious in tone, but even still, it's not going to be long before you see those floating, rotating collectibles that just scream Gex 2. Of course, we've got voodoo dolls to collect. Uh, these Akuji, collect 100 voodoo dolls to increase your health meter. Oh, okay, yeah, that yeah, that's what they do. Um, we've also got energy spirits that are often dropped by enemies. Akuji, uh, these gather will gather 100 of these symbols, and you will gain an additional life. Uh, yeah, yes, you get extra lives from these. Okay, and then there's the uh, the skulls you, you can get. A voodoo spell. You'll find these okay, scattered okay, lady, I get it. The these, these are spells. They give you projection. Each shade of spell has a unique okay. and powerful effect. But beware. Okay, lady, I get it. Um, These are spells. They give you projectile attacks like fireballs and energy bursts. You can fire them with a square button, but you've only got limited ammunition. You only get to use it within the level you found it as well, so it's best that you just go nuts with them when you find them. I've got a really bad habit of aggressively rationing supplies in video games. Maybe it's because I play so many survival horror games, but like even in RPGs, I'm like, no, I gotta save this item, I gotta save this item, then I get to the final boss and I have this overwhelmingly long list of stuff I should've used, and I'm like, I wish I just used all this. With that in mind, I used these as much as I could, even if I could have just used the melee attack. This thing is pretty reliable as well, but of course, there's much less risk in taking damage if you're using ranged moves. Even between these two though, the combat is still pretty simple. Enemies don't take a whole lot of effort to beat, and you'll never find yourself in a room full of enemies that the game will force you to beat before it lets you move on. I really don't care much for platformers that have heavy focus on combat, but here I feel the focus on it is light enough to not take away from the experience. The animations for when you mash the attack button though, they are so dumb. Like the way he jitters in every direction so aggressively. <laughs> I, I think if I saw a dude coming at me like that, I would probably feel more confused than threatened. I know the game wants me to take it seriously, but it's just so difficult. Like, between the goofy collectibles and the animations and the campy narration when you get a power. Doom Blast. Yeah, Doom Blast. That sounds real cool. If I was like eight years old, maybe. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the sound he makes when he falls off a cliff. This sounds like one of those, like, bad fake screams I would do with my friends in, like, high school when we made those bad sketch comedy videos. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Oh! Uh. <laughs> His idle animation is so melodramatic, too. If you let him sit tight for a little bit, he'll scream the name of his bride to the heavens. Gesho! Yeah, this is kind of dumb. Some of the enemy design is kind of cool though. It's all voodoo inspired stuff like cloaked reapers and skeleton worm monsters. I must admit it does feel pretty badass to be fighting enemies like this, especially when you're doing it by blasting fireballs out of your hands. When you're not fighting monsters, you'll be exploring and platforming. You've only got the standard jump, there's no real acrobatics in this game, but you've also got a ledge grab move that you'll use frequently to reach higher areas. Other than that though, you can grab mesh ceilings? I don't know, that's about it. It's pretty bare bones for like move sets when it comes to platforming. The game's main focus is on exploration and basic puzzle solving, throwing switches to move platforms or bringing keys back to doors to unlock them. I love how he does the Zelda item thing when he's putting it down. That's kind of fun. While the levels are pretty linear, your goal being just to reach the portal at the end, exploration is also very important. You'll need a certain amount of ancestor souls to access each boss fight, so if you want to finish the game, you can't just run to the end without looking for them. Them. There's four of them in every stage, often hidden in basic nooks and crannies, but sometimes they'll require figuring out some sort of mechanism to unveil them. You won't need all of them to progress, but you will need a lot, so you'll have to explore every level as thoroughly as you can. You have not collected enough souls for me to open the portal to Okan. 
I did find it kind of annoying having to replay a level or two to find more of these if I didn't have enough to fight the boss, but at the same time, I do really love exploration, and I felt it was a pretty good way to encourage the player to do so. One thing I noticed about this game that I rather like is how they handle pits. When you fall into a pit, the game will often punish you by not taking away a life, but instead having you land in an area that's full of enemies. This will happen less and less as the game goes on, gradually switching the enemies out for pits that'll just straight up take a life. I thought this was a pretty interesting way of handling a difficulty curve. At first, the game's more forgiving with pits, throwing enemies at you instead of killing you, which gives you time to develop the skills you'll need to better avoid them. Hey, like always, credit where credit is due. That is pretty good game design. Speaking of difficulty, let's talk about the bosses, because these are either way too easy or extremely frustrating. It was just the one here, actually. All of these pillars kept getting in the way of the camera, so I'd fall off the stage because I couldn't see where I was going. Ah! When it came time to dodge the boss's projectiles, I had to run in circles in a small area, because if I actually circled the map like the game intended, I was just gonna fall off. The frame rate in this game can also sometimes be absolutely abysmal, especially in the later levels. I think the footage does the talking here, like this is, this is just... Wow, this part here was so bad that I actually could not even tell what was going on. Optimization is key, guys. This isn't this isn't something that's acceptable. But uh, yeah, I, I think that pretty much covers everything. There's really not a whole lot to this game. I guess some of the levels will add minor stage gimmicks, but it's never anything more than this level has trampolines or like uh, this level has platforms that kind of rotate a little bit. It's just a short six hour romp through some voodoo temples, a limbo, forests, and wait, what? Outer space, what? The last levels in outer space and the enemies are aliens. Where did this, where did this come from? This is so out of left field. I mean, like, perhaps I'm speaking from ignorance here because I don't know the first thing about voodoo culture, so I guess I'm willing to give the game the benefit of the doubt and assume that this somehow works in the voodoo? Somehow? I don't know. Even if it is, though, this certainly wasn't what I was expecting from this game. Do you guys care if I spoil the ending? Because, like, it's a Kuji the Heartless. Like, how many of you actually care about the ending of this game? Um, yeah, it ends with Baron Samity being like, oh, um, actually, I'm evil. And then you fight him in what's a, actually a pretty, pretty all right final boss fight. I mean, like, you just attack him until his health is depleted. But I thought the arena was really cool. It's a pretty good size, and there's enough obstacles to get in the way of the crossfire projectiles going back and forth between the two of you, and there's plenty of spots to pick up power-ups to help you in the fight. And his second phase looks pretty cool too, that's a cool looking monster man right there, so yeah, it's kind of fun final boss, I liked it. Akuji then returns to the world of the living, he gets his heart back and reunites with Kesho. Credits. Well, that was, uh, wait, Brian Silva, what like, what, like, uh, his shots no missing. No, I, I know it's not that Brian Silva, but that would be pretty funny. <laughs> Uh, it was okay, I guess, you know, I really wasn't expecting a whole lot from it to begin with. Uh, yeah, pretty laughable in some areas for sure. You could tell they were going for a much darker tone here, but they were still too far in tune with games like Gex and Pandemonium. You can easily see traces of what they're used to making trickle through the cracks here, and it makes it kind of hard to take seriously. But while it is pretty easy to just laugh at this game, I actually find it really interesting. Here we have a company so deep-rooted and family-friendly tropes that they have them appearing in their first attempt to make something more mature. It really is a transitionary piece. Between this game and Soul Reaver, you see them not suddenly, but slowly work themselves away from these things. So, as a piece of history, Akuji is a fairly interesting game, from a development point of view at the very least. They'd go on to make Soul Reaver right after this, and that became a very beloved game. My friend Alex loves it so much that he's got a tattoo from the series. But imagine an alternate universe in which Akuji never got made and instead they jumped right into Soul Reaver. We might have seen that cartoony hokiness bleed into that game, so I think it was a good idea to make this game to get some practice in first. And that's all this game really seems like to me, is just practice. You can tell from the demo screen alone how much they wanted to just move on from it, so why don't we move on as well? Let's cover something really bad. Rascal's up next. See you guys then. 
Hi everybody, thank you for watching my video. Uh, if you want to see another one on another platformer game, I've got a link right here to another one. And if you'd like to support the show and help me continue doing this as a full-time job, you can donate a dollar a month to my Patreon and get access to the Nitrad podcast and blooper reels and some other bonus stuff. But yeah, thank you guys so much, and I'll see you again soon.